Hey guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome to another Dart tutorial video. This will be video two, and today we'll be covering classes and objects inside of Dart. Before I get into the code, however, I do need to mention that all of the code in these tutorials will be in Dart 2 syntax. This means that you need to install the Dart Developer SDK if you want to use Dart 2, and you want to set up a specific environment variable so that the virtual machine knows to use the Dart 2 snapshot rather than the Dart 1 snapshot. Inside of Visual Studio Code, if you go into your user settings and you search for VM, you'll find this little setting. This is Dart VM Additional Args. If you click this little pen here, you can copy it over to the right side. And then inside of the two brackets here, you want to add dash dash preview dash Dart dash 2. What this will do is it will make it so that when you run a Dart app from Visual Studio Code, it will automatically boot it in Dart 2 mode. Now if you want to actually set the environment variable so that you can run it from any terminal, you just use these commands. So on Windows you run set Dart underscore VM underscore options equals dash dash preview dash Dart dash 2. And then on Linux or OS X, you use export instead of set. And this will allow you to set up your terminals and stuff so that it will run Dart 2 by default. Now I'll make sure to leave all these comments inside of the GitHub repository so that if you guys need a refresher on how to do this, you can just take a look there. All right, so now with all of that out of the way, let's talk about classes. So what's a class? Well, a class is sort of like a blueprint to create multiple objects. So the idea is that you create these properties, which are fields, and then you create methods and things like that for behavior, and then you can instantiate this into various different objects, and then those objects can be used inside of your application. Inside of Dart, anything that you can assign to a variable is considered an object. This includes functions and closures. All of them are objects and they have built-in methods and stuff like that. So down here I have a class that I created called point and we have two properties x and y and then we just have this simple addition method attached to this point class. Every class has a default constructor. So if I want to instantiate a point, I can just say var p equals point, and this will create a new instance of the point class. If I want to set up x and y with this type of default constructor, I can just use the cascade operator, which is these double dots. What this does is it takes the result of the line before it, and then applies the next item. So in this case, we instantiate point, then we apply the x setter, and then we apply the Y setter. You can also use normal Dart syntax to get and set variables inside of an object. So here I'm just saying p.x and I'm setting it equal to 20 and then I'm saying p.y and I'm setting it equal to 30 and then I can call p.add together and this will invoke this method on these two X and Y values. So here I can run the application and we get back 50 because 20 plus 30 is 50. All right, so now let's talk about constructors. So in many object-oriented programming languages, if you wanted to create a constructor, you would write something like this. When we invoke point, we bring in a integer x and an integer y, and then we want to assign these values into the values that are attached to the object that we're instantiating. Now this won't work inside of Dart because Dart has lexical scoping, which means that both x and y here are available inside of this block here. So this would cause a problem. Now this is why we have the this keyword. This differentiates the instance of these variables. So by saying this x, we're saying we want this particular x, which is attached to the class. And by saying this y, we're doing the same. So we're saying, all right, pass in a value x and then assign it to the objects x and do the same for the objects y. So this is the longhand for writing a constructor like this. Dart has syntactic sugar for writing a constructor. And so all we have to do to create that last constructor is just say point and then put in this x and this y. And this is equivalent to what we had before. Many other programming languages allow you to have multiple constructors for objects. 
Dart does as well. However, you need to use what are called named constructors. You can see here if I try to create a constructor for point again, we get an error for both of our constructors. And the error says that the default constructor has already been defined. So instead, I can create what's called a named constructor. So I can say point dot zero. And now this is a constructor which will set x and y to zero when we call it and create a new point. We also have what are called factory constructors inside of classes. Factory constructors are constructors that are typically used for when you want to maybe grab an instance of an object rather than return an entirely new instance. So maybe you're getting the instance from say a cache store or from like a database. Or maybe you want to return like a subtype. So for instance, say we had an inherited type that inherits the point. Maybe we would want to return that subtype rather than a point from our point class. So here's an example of a factory constructor that's pulling from a cache and it allows us to either create a new point or pull the point from the cache if it exists. So let me walk you through the changes that I've made to this class. So first up at the top, I've created a new field called name. This is a final field and we'll talk about what the implications of that are in a moment. Then I've created the cache and I've made this static as well as final. Now static means that it's actually attached to the class here. This means that every single instance of this class is pointing towards the same map here. So every point has a reference to this cache map and there aren't multiple instances of this cache map. Then inside of the point default constructor, I've made name optional by putting it in as this dot name and putting it inside of brackets. This also means that it's a named property. And as you can see down here, when I invoke the constructor, I have to say name and then colon and then put in the name. Then for the named constructor point zero, I'm putting name here and we'll talk about why I'm doing that in a moment rather than down inside of the body where we have X and Y. For the factory constructor, I have to call it something that's not the default constructor's name. So this is like a named constructor, but we just preface it with factory. So we're saying, okay, point dot fact, passing in a string name, and then we just want to check to see if the cache contains the name already. And if it does, then we just return the cache name. So we return the point from the cache. Otherwise, we create a new point and we pass in the name and then we return it. And actually, because I want to put these points inside of our cache, I'm just going to say final point equals point with zero, zero, and then name. And then I'll assign point to the cache name. And then I'll return the point from this constructor. Now down here at the bottom, I also created a method to actually save a point inside of the cache. So we just say cache name equals a new point with X and Y and then the name inside of it. So we can just call this on one of our points and it will take the X and Y, create a new point as well as the name and then pass it into the map. So here I can then instantiate a new point P1 using point.fact and giving it a name of test. And then I'm going to change P1, X and Y to 10 and 20 and then I'm going to save them. Then down here, I'm going to instantiate a new point called test two. And then I want to instantiate another point called test again. And we want to see if P1 and P3 are the same. So here we can print out P3X and P3Y. And this will allow us to see if they are 10 and 20. And so yes, this did get the point out of the cache. So now we have 10 and 20. So this means that this point here, this instance of the point here, is the same as this point here. So factory constructors are pretty useful for creating a singleton pattern as well. And that's something that we'll talk about at a later date. All right, so there are a few other things that we need to mention in here. So I mentioned before that this is a final string name. And a final variable is not an immutable variable. It's a variable that can only be assigned a single time. 
So when this point gets instantiated, the string name needs to be assigned, otherwise it cannot be mutated later, unless you create a new instance of the point class. So for instance, if you look at the point zero constructor, we have this rather strange syntax right here for assigning name to zero. And if I take this section and just remove it, and then come in here and say name equals zero, you'll see that we'll get an error and, and it'll say name cannot be assigned because it's marked as final. This syntax up here is what's called an initializer list. By using this little colon, what you're saying is that you want to essentially execute this code before the body of the constructor. This means that this gets executed when the point itself gets instantiated. If we want to assign values to a final variable, we have to do that as the point is being instantiated rather than afterwards. So this is a good way of getting around it. All right, so while we're inside of this class, let's talk about the toString and hash code methods which are attached to every single object inside of Dart. Every object inside of Dart inherits from a superclass called object. An object by default has a toString method attached to it as well as a hash code method attached to it. We can override these methods and make it so that, for instance, the toString method will show us a string representation of our point. So here if I call toString, it will say point at x and y named and then pass in the name. So now up here I can call print p1 to string and p3 to string and then this will print out the string representation of these points. So here you can see it just says point at 1020 named test and because both of the points are the same, they come out the same. Now the hash code method has to do with how Dart allows you to compare one object to another. So with the hash code method, we can also override the operator for equals to. So we just say override operator double equals. And then in this case, we pass in what we want to compare it to, which will be other. So what we're doing here is we're just saying if other is a point, and other x equals x, and other y equals y, and other name equals name, then the two objects are equivalent. We now do get back true, because they are equivalent. So this is one way of comparing things. The other way is using hash codes. Now we'll go into more detail as to how these hash codes are calculated, but hash codes in essence are just integers that are assigned to an object. So here I can say print p1 hash code and p3 hash code, and these will print out the integers that represent these objects inside of the Dart virtual machine. So here we can see, even though these two instances are roughly the same, we have a radically different hash code for the first one than we have for the second one. And there are various ways you could modify this hash code function. You could even put in a static number so that all points have the same hash code. So here I've put in the number 100 and now all of our points should have the same hash code. So here you can see we've got 100 for both of the points. So you guys may have noticed that the cache variable has an underscore. This makes it private. And so it's bound to the point block and we cannot reference it outside of the point block. Sometimes this can be useful if we say, for instance, make all of our variables private. So in this case, I've made x and y private and all of the other places where we have x and y, I need to add the underscore as well. Now you'll notice that if I go into the main function and I want to gain access to one of these values, I can do it. And that's because these values are actually accessible inside of the same file. So if this main function was in a different file, then we would have no access to these underscore values. And the reason we don't have access to the cache value is because it's also static. And by making it static, we're making it private for the class itself, whereas a normal private variable is private for the entire file. Let's just pretend, however, that we cannot access x and y 
If we pretend for a moment that we cannot access x and y, then we can create what are called getters, which will allow us to get these values, and we can create setters, which will allow us to set these values. Here we have our private x and y, and if I want to get x or get y, I can just use the keyword get, and then create a quick little function which allows me to just get the value. And here are the setters. Setters by default do not return anything, so I put void in front of them, and then we just say set x, we pass in a value, and then that value gets applied to underscore x, and then setting y, we pass in a value, and that value gets applied to underscore y. So now inside of our main function, we can access these getters and setters. So these are the setters, and they look like how we were assigning our variables before, where we just say p1.x equals 30, and p1.y equals 300. And of course, the getters are exactly the same as well. So you can just use the dot syntax to use the getters and the setters. We can also create getters that get variables that may not be specifically attached to the class. So for instance, if we wanted to create a add getter, then we could just add x and y together and then pass it back through this add property. So this is similar to our add together method down here, except now we've created a property that contains that value. And of course, like any other getter, we can just call p1.add and then this will get some of these two values. And these getters and setters can be as complicated as you want them to be. Now let's talk about inheritance and abstract classes inside of Dart. So abstract classes are basically interfaces inside of Dart. They allow us to create a shape of a class or an object. However, we cannot instantiate an abstract class directly. So for instance, I've got this thing class here. If I try to instantiate it, you'll see that we get an error because it's abstract. So instead of instantiating the abstract class thing, we can create a new class, say, called chair, and have it extend thing. And then our chair here will have a constructor of its own where we pass in a string for name and an integer for age. And then we can use an initializer list to call up to our super constructor, which is this one here, and pass in name and age. So even though name and age will be associated with the chair object that we're creating, we're just using these properties as the pattern for that object. Then down here we can override the getter method for color because it has no concrete implementation inside of our abstract class, and we can make it so that it automatically returns blue for all of the chairs. Inside of Dart, all objects and classes have a single inheritance. This means that they can only inherit from one other object. So the chair class can only extend the thing abstract class, and we can't extend another class on top of that. Of course, all of our objects also extend the default object class, which is built into Dart, but that is not counted in this quote-unquote single inheritance. So you can see here, if I create class A and class B, and then I extend class A and B with a class C, we get an error because it doesn't want us to extend both of the classes. We can, however, implement two classes. What this does is it allows us to implement the interfaces or the patterns from class A and class B. So say class A has two properties A and B, and then class B has one property C. Now, because we're implementing both A and B, class C should have both A and B as well as C. And of course, we need to override them. So we get override for int A, override for int B, and override for int C. So we're not inheriting from these classes. Instead, we're just using these classes to form the shape for class C. So the main difference between inheriting from a class and just implementing a class is that when we inherit from a class, we extend the functionality of the class that we're inheriting from. Whereas when we implement from a class, we're just forming the shape of the class that we're implementing. Dart also has what are called mix-ins, and that's a topic that we'll cover in another tutorial. And mix-ins allow us to kind of bypass the whole single inheritance rule.
Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you disliked the video, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. Have a good night.